welcome everyone. Thank you for coming uh, or joining us today. Uh, my name is Zichuan Lim. I'm from Changna Taekwondo. I also run a HR consultancy called Tempexel Consulting. Um, this is this lovely gentleman right here is Michael McGee. Uh, Michael and I used to be both coaches on the UTS um, University of Technology Sydney uh, Taekwondo team. So I guess the way I describe it was I would take the mighty ducks and then train them from people with no experience to some sort of level of experience and then I hand them over to Michael uh, and then he would polish them and turn them into machines. <laughs> Kind of the way that it's kind of the way we worked. Uh, so today we've got a combination of people, a few people off my LinkedIn network, um, a few people from my school, uh, and also a number of people from uh, one of my friends' associations. Who it's like a career development and coaching committee, um, which is which is really 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 exciting. Um, so what we'll do today is we'll have a bit of a chat, you know, um, about mindset. COVID, uh, a few other things as well. Before I do that, I, I'll just like, um, like Michael to introduce himself a little bit more so that you get a bit more of an idea of his background and, and um, kind of what, where he's coming from. Thanks, E. So yeah, I guess a bit about me probably helps to start with how I know Z. So as he mentioned, I met Z when I was working with him at UTS Taekwondo. Um, I think in terms of martial arts experience, I have a, about a 15 year background in, in training and competing and that sort of stuff. Um, it includes karate, boxing, kickboxing, various martial arts, but most of my experience combat sports wise has been in Taekwondo. So I'm a third and black belt. Um, I love sparring and competition. So most of my training experience kind of comes there. Um, represented the state, the country, at various state, national and international events. Um, and I think uh, really took heart, like sort of Taekwondo sparring coaching quite seriously for maybe five years or so. Uh, and in that time, worked with Z and the other coaches at UTS, as well as, I guess, other clubs around New South Wales as well, and developed a bit of a sort of high performance sparring program where we tried to develop people that had come through and wanted to do, you know, high level of competition. and get them ready for that and train them up to compete and to win. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, I have a, I guess, a professional background as a psychologist. So I've worked in public health sector, sports sector uh, and private practice, uh, helping clients, individuals and teams perform at their best and, and obviously to optimize health and mental health. Uh, at the moment, the bulk of my work is with the New South Wales Moritas. Um, I'm the player development manager there, sort of a holistic case manager, mental health, well-being sort of role, but also facilitates sort of mental skills development and resilience and that sort of stuff with the team. We, um, we've just been completing a, a bridged professional rugby season uh, in the COVID bubble. So trying to work with the, the players there and I guess sustained high performance in, in a weird place is, has been really challenging, but really exciting. So hopefully there's some lessons here today that we can sort of unpack and, you know, mm. might be helpful for you. So I don't yeah, know, yeah. that's me. Cool. Thanks, Michael. So I, I think, you know, given the audience that we have today um, and the fact that we're also recording this for, for later on, the way I'm going to approach the questions just for the people in the audience is we're, we're going to take a little bit of a sports approach and a little bit of a, a corporate approach at the same time. Um, and I think Michael's last point about the abridged uh, rugby union season at the moment is, is a great lead into the first question because, you know, this year a lot has been put on hold for, for everybody. You know, the Olympics, for example, has been put on hold uh, until next year. People who are in year 12, people who are, um, you know, in uni, your graduations and all, all the kind of fun events um, can't go ahead. So uh, it's, it's been quite a tricky year. And in the company, you know, in the business world, you know, a lot of business has been put on hold. So, um, you know, a lot of people have been affected by restructuring at work. Um, and also a lot of projects have been on hold. If you're in anything that requires some sort of capital spend um, that isn't digitization, then you, you, you know, are fighting quite hard. And, and, and 
may not be able to um, get those projects over the line. So, you know, in these kind of situations, Michael, um, what tips do you have to help people to stay focused and, and kind of stay motivated when the finishing line is, is quite hazy or maybe keeps moving uh, further down the track? Yeah. It can be hard to stay on target when uh, the goals become a bit further away or more ambiguous. Is that? Yeah, yeah like imagine being an Olympian, right? You've trained for like, the Olympics should be over, I'm pretty sure. You know, you'd be like, hey, I should be done. I should be partying by now. But bugger, I've got to train another year. Yeah. Well, some, <laughs> some athletes have sort of retired and have given up that chance. Yeah. yeah, it's very tricky. I think um, I want to make one point before I, I go into any depth about the answer. And that is that, you know, these are quite challenging times. I think under the sorts of pressures that you're talking about, uh, when we lose important potential events, when we have job stress, work stress, um, insecurity, all that sort of stuff that can push us to the edge of our emotional boundaries in a way. So it can be difficult from a psychological perspective or, you know, just in many different ways. And if you get to the point where what you're going through is affecting you to the point that, you know, you're making poor decisions, you're feeling low or anxious or hopeless for, you know, a significant period of time, like more than a week, um, you're not solving those problems, it's affecting your sleep, um, or you're starting to use unhelpful habits like drugs or alcohol, or binge eating, or you know, things like the computer games, all that sort of stuff, then it's probably important to recognize that you know, there's warning, warning signs here and you should speak to a health professional. So that's um, an important thing. Um, you know, there's lots yep. of, whether it's a GP or a psychologist or someone to help you get on track and motivated and just to ask for help. We had Are You Okay Day yesterday, and I think that's a, mm. there's a lot of resources through their website for people who maybe see, you know, they need support or they want to ask other people how they're doing. So just be aware that, you know, that's one side of the coin. Um, but to answer your question, you know, in a more general, I guess, more specific sense rather, is I think that as humans, we need, we need a combination in our life of short, medium and long-term goals. So, and we need rewards when we have those goals. So little things that we look forward that help us to get through every day, that help us to sort of have things to look forward to in the short and medium term and over a couple of weeks and months and also bigger picture stuff that's more important to us. Um, when those short and medium term goals go away, so there's not something that you're working towards, it can be easy to kind of, you know, lose motivation and maybe let things slip away that, you know, haven't been, you know, maybe you just stop working towards goals. So in a training example is really, you know, really obvious. So, you know, a lot of people, might have the goal of competing in a competition. So they might pick a comp at some point in the year and they'll train really hard for that and they'll work towards it. And at the end, win or lose, you normally pat yourself on the back for that preparation and having a go and achieving a few things that you set for yourself. And then, you know, maybe you have a few days of eating fried chicken and um, you, you decide whether or not you're going to do that again or you pick a different a few days. Yeah. And in, I mean, in Taekwondo, we have, we have grading system for people that are students. So that's a really nice way to motivate yourself to train and to do all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, work situations can be a little bit different. It's a bit more ambiguous, especially if there's uncertainty about your role or you're looking for work um, and attempts to find a job aren't going particularly well. So I guess to stay on target or to motivate ourselves to keep going despite this uncertainty and potentially a loss of these, these goals is maybe to break it down a little bit. And, I, and I'll just give a few examples of what I, a conversation that I might have with somebody. So first, I pro probably try and find out what that goal is. I try and find out why that goal is important to a person. We do a bit to establish, you know, what area of life that goal will influence. Um, then exploring, you know, what's making the goal ambiguous or hazy? Why is it hard now as a goal as opposed to before? You know, do you have any control or ways that you can change or influence that goal? Or is the circumstances around you have led to the point where you can't accomplish it at all? So maybe it's worth, if that happens, considering whether there's, a, there's another way that you can improve this area of your life. And if there's not, maybe there's another area of your life that you can focus your attention on and create goals and rewards in. Um, can I give you an example of how that might play out? Yeah, that's yeah, that would be great. So let's let's look at the Taekwondo competition example, right? You got, you're a young student or whatever your stage is, and you want to do a competition. So you set yourself a goal that you're going to compete at a state championships in a certain point of the year. 
if we look at why that's important, uh, there might be a few things. The first one is you like doing the sport, so you enjoy Taekwondo. Uh, the next one might be that you like competition. Uh, the third one may be that when you have that health goal, so a fitness goal like a competition, you eat well and you diet and you don't drink alcohol and you do all these positive sort of stuff for your body. So there's three areas. It's like there's your physical health, competition is a drive, and then also the thing about enjoying Taekwondo. So keep going down, you might go like, what's making that goal ambiguous? So at the moment, as far as I know, there's no Taekwondo competitions in New South Wales. You can't do one. So we don't know when it's going to be. Um, if you ask yourself a question, like how much control do you have over that? What's the answer? You don't really have that much. Yeah, nothing. There's, no, there's nothing really that as individuals that we can do right now, other than practice our social distancing and you know, don't catch and contagion others with COVID. Um, but there's not much you can do. So in that sense, that means you can't really do much about that goal. You're probably not going to be able to do the competition. So let's have a chat briefly and, you know, people can throw it in the chat box if they can think of it, but is there another way you could improve this area of your life? So there's three different areas. So in terms of enjoying Taekwondo, if you can't do a competition, what other things might you be able to do to, I guess, address that area or that thing that's important to you? What's a goal that you could set for yourself? So you can throw a suggestion yeah. out of the I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off, hey? Um, so, you know, I think uh, if we take the, an example from, from earlier this year when we had shutdown, you know, people couldn't train at all. Uh, so, so, you know, getting to a competition or being ready for a competition was, was pretty much impossible. Um, but now, dojangs are back open, so people can, can at least get back into training and get used to to moving again you know getting burning off that that covid or that lockdown extra weight mm -hmm. i guess um other things that you could do you know i've done a lot of um, online competitions it's not a sparring type thing but it's pumse i know you know pumse is a dirty word for you but um uh, I, but for me it's something else you know it gave me something to do gave me something to to focus on and actually helped me improve a lot during a time where you couldn't really do a lot of, um, you know, sparring training. So, you know, switch it to the other, switch it to the other element um, of our sport. I think um, you've got it's a, been good fun. You've kind of nailed what I would say there. So I think um, shifting your focus on what you can do and maybe looking at something that if you did develop it would make you better when it comes time to do a competition again. So yes, I'm not the most, uh, uh, Pumps a minded person when it comes to Taekwondo training, but um, there's a place for developing your technical skills. So if you're a Taekwondo practitioner and you spend, you know, a period of time that you can't do a comp, you set a, a short or medium or even a long-term goal for three or six or 12 months. So, you know, you want to get much, much more fit and flexible and in good condition so that when it comes time that you can go and do um, Taekwondo sparring and Taekwondo competitions that you're, able to basically your, your body is in a better shape than it was maybe 12 months ago that you're you know you can jump back in and you're fit and you're strong and your technical ability like your kicking is really good um, mm. and if you can't do all those sort of things and you still have that drive for competition you need to find maybe other ways to address that maybe like you know competitions on against friends on board games or some other sport like tennis or i don't know tennis is I'm just throwing it out there so um, yeah got a, yeah that's right um, and and Winnie's added one into the chat. So she said, um, focusing on on particular elements of the sport. So you know, you may not be able to do a full on sparring match, but you can do things uh, like general refinement of techniques, or you know, your your stepping, uh, distance management, court control, exactly. that kind of stuff yeah. as well. And and it would be. Um, I think. Yeah. Oh, go first. Um, I was going to say in the um, corporate space. You know, basically, as, as athletes, we need to keep moving, we need to keep stretching, we need to keep exercising. Otherwise, when we do go back into the sport, we are so far behind um, and it takes us a long time to catch up. So in the corporate space, it's kind of similar. You know, you might be feeling like you're stuck in a rut for, you know, this, this period at the moment. Um, but... Um, you know, keeping keeping your technical skills up to date, keeping keeping in touch with your network, that kind of 
you know, it's work in a sense um, is, is very important because, you know, when things turn around and, and things eventually always turn around, um, you get to um, be in, in a bit of a front foot, you know, front of mind, you, you still know what you're doing. Um, you're still in the game, basically. Um, so, you know, we're talking quite a specific Taekwondo example here, but it, it does translate quite easily across into the corporate space. I think the final point I'll make about this sort of staying on target and shifting your goals is in some of the situations that you might be struggling in, you know, you may not be able to solve the problem and even improve that area of your life. So there's a lot of people that are, say, stuck inside in Melbourne at the moment and they can't do all of the things that they want to do. Um, you know, for say, you know, someone that wants to go to work and that keeps them happy and motivated and all that sort of stuff. If they can't do that at the moment, then, you know, there's different areas of their life that they need to focus some of their attention on, I guess. So you could look at, you know, using that time to, as Z sort of alluded to, to network or to mentor or to, you know, enhance your professional relationships and whatnot. But you could also just look at a completely different area of your life, which would also help you feel maybe the accomplishment that you're missing out on by not having a job. So going to, um, you know, physical health and fitness might be one of feeling good that you're in a routine and you're not stalled in that sense can help you to stop feeling stalled in other areas of your life where you've lost a bit of control. Um, it's probably a, more than enough time to talk about that sort of that question I think unless there's any yeah. so maybe move on yeah, to unless that. anyone else has questions um, in in the audience or in the chat we can I have another one bring it on bring it on all right so athletes and entrepreneurs actors even we often talk about the grind um, so and the grind is the process of getting up doing the work uh, without knowing exactly when it's going to pay off and our basic psychology is, is based really on immediate gratification, you know. Um, you see it in kids. They get a lolly and they're really happy. They don't get a lolly, they're not happy. Um, and there's a very famous experiment to do with marshmallows. Uh, and if, um, if a kid can delay getting the marshmallow or taking the marshmallow um, for a period of time with the promise of getting double, then those kids apparently do really well later in life. Um, so, you know, we, we intrinsically want to see results quickly, uh, and we, but we don't always get to do this. Um, progress isn't always incremental. And I think, you know, martial arts and sports in general is a great example. At the start, you progress very quickly um, and you see improvements very quickly, but then later on, you have to work harder and harder uh, to get improvements. Uh, and I think careers are similar. Like sometimes you can move very quickly at the start of your career, and then later on, it takes, you know, three or four years, five years, 10 years before your next jump in level. Um, so, you know, sometimes it doesn't look like anything's happening at all. And then suddenly you get a jump. Um, so in terms of your perspective on this, Michael, you know, what, what do you think? Is this something that you see um, as a professional, you know, player development manager? Uh, and how do people know if they're making progress and how do they judge if that progress is in the right direction? Um, good question. I think just visiting the idea of the marshmallow experiment and the grind is, you know, the lessons from that sort of research is in the area of self-control and delayed gratification. Um, yeah, what those initial studies sort of showed is people who, or children who were able to, I guess, be patient and wait um, longer to get a bigger reward. They were more likely to develop well in their lives and end up having good outcomes at school and everything. And you can see how that can be helpful, that type of behaviour. So maybe doing more studies so that you know you get a good result on a test or putting uh, time and energy into a particular thing that leads to a long-term reward. If you have that disposition, then you're probably more likely to hang around when the going gets tough or to stick to a series of behaviours when things aren't initially showing a reward because you get an outcome in the long and those, the thing about that is um, just because it was done with kids and it showed that doesn't mean that we can't all improve our ability to do that sort of stuff. It's mostly around being able to engage in goal-directed behaviour and sustain that behaviour despite distractions or low motivation or anything along those lines. I think 
working out if you're in the right, going in the right direction is, is, a, bit, is a bit straightforward, but it requires a bit of hard work and introspection. Um, what I suggest is, you know, make sure that you are thinking about, you know, what you lo- want your life to look like long term. And there's lots of different exercises that people can do. But I guess the easiest one would be to think about, you know, if you think about yourself at your 80th birthday or at a funeral, um, where you're, you know, watching over your own thing, like how did you want people to know you if you've had a long and successful and happy life? How do you want to, you know, how do you want to have other people say that you behaved or what type of person you were? And then also considering, you know, looking at difficult decisions that you have to make or whether you want to quit about quit, quit an activity or not is remembering, you know, how do you want to remember yourself in that difficult moment? And then once you can kind of answer these questions about, you know, how you want people to say you treated them, how, you want people, how do you want to remember yourself dealing with difficult situations? And also just more broadly, what did you want your life to look like? What did you want to be good at and all that sort of stuff? Then you can be a bit more aware about what's important to you, what your values are, and then make your short, long and medium term goals, I guess, link up with the person that you want to become. So then if you get to the point where you're unclear in any moment about whether you're heading in the right direction or this thing is worth doing, you can check in with yourself and stop and sort of in that moment say, is what I'm doing right now in, in line with the person that I want to become? So if you want to be someone that's always been acting in integrity um, and you're given the opportunity to do something which will get you ahead but is illegal, um, you maybe have to stop and say, hey, you know, I'm, if I do this, I might get what I'm looking for as a shortcut, but I'm not actually becoming the person that I want to be uh, and the person that I'll be known for and all that sort of stuff. So those sort of moments, you know, they, they help guide, I guess, our immediate decision making about, you know, in the moment stuff or difficult decisions, but it also helps to, you know, have a trajectory about where you want to go and know that you're heading the right way because you've spent some time thinking about what you want from your life what is important to you and how you want to behave in ambiguous situations. So does that answer your question, Z? Is that helpful? Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. Um, I've just been scribbling amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the, the part you mentioned about, you know, how do you want to uh, think back on your difficult decisions and then how do you want to you know, handle those. I think that's a very good point. I mean, it's something that uh, I haven't thought too much about. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that, that sometimes that's really where it, it's, it's, it's a concept of um, moments of truth. So it's, it's really, you know, it's a small point in time. It's one decision or one conversation that actually makes a huge difference and it, it changes perspectives. It can change outcomes of, you know, many, 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 many different things. Mm. Um, and I think that was a very, very salient point uh, to bring up. Um, yeah. Does anyone in, if, if you again have any, any questions or, or input that you'd like to add in, please feel free to do so. Um, the, the short term, short, medium, long term goals um, and, and lining them all up, I think, um, you know, is, it, it sounds easy, um, uh, not always, not always easy to do. Um, and, and I think, you know, we all are taught to set goals or hopefully we're all taught to set goals and, and most of us do set goals, but whether we, we line them up in that way, in, in terms of that long-term direction, you know, I, I find that a lot of my goals are very all over the shop. The long-term goals are up there. The short-term goals are down there. Do they necessarily line up? Not always, you know. Um, a lot of my short-term goals involve eating cake. Um, it doesn't really line up with my long-term goal of being super healthy, for example. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, um, you know, thinking of that and thinking of that in a training type of uh element you know when we were both coaches at, at uts i remember you had a bit of a revelation in terms of uh training focus when it came to competition um because for those who aren't taekwondo enthusiasts you know we're not like football or rugby uh, where we get to have a competition every week 
you know, our competitions, if we're lucky in Australia, are once every three months. Um, so it's a very, very long cycle. And as an athlete, it's a very long uh, training cycle to get ready for a comp. And it's also a very slow feedback cycle in terms of, you know, your competition experience and, and the learnings that you can take away from those kind of situations. Um, I think, though, it's very similar to, to the work environment. You know, in, in the work sense, you don't really get to go for promotion every week. You, you get the chance to go for promotion every, you know, couple of years, probably, if you're lucky. Mm. Um, so, you know, with this peak and trough kind of concept, um, what are the similarities and differences in approaches for Taekwondo versus rugby? You know, all that, you know, long-term competition or long-term opportunity versus short-term opportunity. Um, and, and how do you handle these peaks and troughs without having the physical and mental burnout? Um, I'll start with that part of the question and then I'll move to the next part later on. Okay. Um, I think I might start with that point around the, the revelation. Uh, of, of where we got to with, with sparring training and, and the competition thing. Um, even though we, I think there's a, a couple of unique things around the Taekwondo competitions and the three monthly stuff. So even though, even though the competitions are well spread out, there's still work that can be done around that competition performance process. Like the conditions that you're competing in, even though they're very far apart, they're not that they're not massively different. You're on mats in the same safety gear, often fighting the same people. And you just have to work out how to optimize the conditions to perform really, really well every time you get on the mat, regardless of whether that's a week apart or that's six months or 12 months or two years apart. Um, the way that we did that at the club was by getting the, getting the athletes to come up with and develop effectively a 15 or 20 minute warm up process, maybe even longer, that they could use every single match. So in a comp competition, there's, a, there's basically, you know, they might fight up six times in a day. So having a warm up and a cool down that they could walk into the club and I could say, all right, I want you to fight in 20 minutes. They could be just as ready for a competition as if they went and did the warm up in their fifth or sixth fight for a gold medal at a national championships. Um, it could kind of cues mentally, physiologically and um, you know, in every way that you need to, there's, there's that awareness of like, all right, my body is exactly where it needs to be and I'm moving and, and keeps, I guess that repetition of the same skills means that when you go onto the mat, if you have specific things that are different to the previous game plans and you're going to try and execute, you can see if they have been done well and if they worked because you know that every condition is set up for that person to be in their optimal zone, their ready moment to compete. So part of the process, I think, in, you know, in doing you know, long-term competition you know, every, every few months is getting really clear about what are the things that you want to execute differently um, in your preparation, but also in your performance at that time. So most of the time, um, you know, people will come off and they'll have a couple of things that they need to work on in, in their event. So handling those peaks and troughs are about going, what did I, what, what did I do well? What am I good at here? And what can I improve on for next time? And then coming up with those and working out a way in you know, that three months or that six months or however long that they can improve that. And I guess that's where it can be really easy when you have goals like that and systems like that set up because then you can, you know, focus on for the next comp and it builds your motivation and kind of goes back to the original question that you said about the absence of that being quite difficult for people. So um, in terms of the only, I the only difficulty that I can see with that is mostly around having the motivation to keep training when you're at the beginning of that process and starting again. And that's, I suppose, where it takes a bit of that long-term focus and discipline to, you know, after the comp to get back on and do the, maybe the conditioning work that you need to do to get yourself back up to speed to start again or managing any niggling injuries that you picked up and all that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Where that's a very Taekwondo specific answer, is that kind of what you were looking for there? Yeah, I think so. I think that that makes sense. Um, one thing I wanted to check is, you know, in a shorter cycle, so something like football, um, you hear the coaches after the match and they say, okay, we need to improve on X, Y, Z, you know, do they just turn up on Monday or the next training session and, and just head, headstrong, just go straight into that? Is that, is that how they 
tend to get things done because it's just such a shorter turnaround. You know, you don't have three months to fix the problem. Yeah, I think it's it's different for the athletes and for the, maybe the coaches and high performance staff. Um, mm-hmm. uh, for your your athletes, the people that are competing, they straight after the the match, they probably just need a bit of time to physically recover. Uh, and then I think a lot of the coaches go into overdrive into the work that they're doing and the planning. So they review those performances and get as much information together as, as they can that will be helpful for the following week or for the next match. So what the environment kind of looks like here is that you know, on a, if the team say compete on a Saturday night, they'll have a they'll have their competition. Everybody gets a day off on Sunday, so everybody goes home and rests. On Monday morning, the players will come in and the coaches have set up reviews. And there's I guess a, a lot of specialty coaches, there's attack coaches, defense coaches, um, there's a head coach who oversees sort of a, a you know, bigger picture stuff. And then there's very specific and niche, you know, coaches for particular areas of the game. And I think what is done is that positive and constructive feedback is quickly delivered. It's, it can be done in, on the field. It can be done with often most of the time with performance analysis and video cameras. And then people will take their lessons from that about where they can improve. And then the focus will shift to how they're going to compete for the next week. So take your lesson, review, take your lessons, or, you know, put it all on, try and keep it, um, you know, constructive and, and focus, and then move the focus from there to, I guess, what the next job is, which is the game the following week. And, um, you know, sometimes just after difficulty, especially just being able to have that process in place where you can review something that, right, what happened here? What can I do better? What can you do better? How can we communicate about this if it happens again? And then just shifting your attention to a collective goal or something bigger, which is, you know, the next competition or the next week. I, I think that's really useful to probably in a corporate setting as well, and especially if you have, yeah. to, you know, you're working within a team environment and there's, you know, difficulty with a project or someone misses a deadline to be able to just reflect and review on it, work out how you can help each other and then work out collaboratively, all right, what are we doing next? How are we going to do this? It's, um, it's a positive sort of focus there. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of projects, you know, in, in corporate, we, we worked on um, quite large and sometimes very long projects. And, um, you know, one thing that we don't always do so well in the corporate space is a, a, a good post-implementation review. Um, you know, you, you often you finish the project uh, and then you just jump onto the next one without really looking at what you've done well or not so well. Uh, in the past. So uh, I think there's a great analogy that, you know, maybe as the doer, you're the, you're the athlete, right? So you probably after doing all the work in the project, uh, you probably feel like you need to take a bit of time off uh, just to mentally recover and, and, you know, take a break. You know, you can't really take a break at work, but you can not jump into the next project so quickly, perhaps, if you're lucky enough. Um, and as a, uh, but then you still have to reflect, you know, how did I get this across the line? What did I miss? How can I, you know, influence people to, to help get the um, results faster, perhaps? Um, but as a manager, then, you know, there, there's the, the other level, right? So the manager is more like the coaching staff. Now, unfortunately, uh, you don't always have a whole team of managers with different expertise. There's often just one manager uh, who has to, to carry all the hats. But then as, as the manager or the coach, you have to try to figure out, you know, which, um, how, how can you lead the team better next time? Uh, because, you know, no doubt you, you're going to run into the next project quite quickly. Um, it's about getting ready uh, for that later on. Yeah. I think, um, mm-hmm. I think there's a few things in that, that, um, you know, giving, as a manager, giving staff the opportunity to review um, probably as close to the project finishing as possible can be, you know, potentially a way of people still working, but maybe not having as intense a level of complexity in their role for a day or for half a day, even uh, as if you just immediately put presented them with a new project plan and a new proposal. Um, the thing about the management stuff as well is that I think it's important to recognize like you can do your individual reviews and your group reviews. Um, a manager can also consider, you know, in the next project based on how things were done, how might they be able to optimize the instructions that they give or the plans that they put together that they give to those staff that are helping them and working underneath them and that they're, you know, directing um, and trying to use that review to help, you know, if if you understand each other really well and your learning styles are 
optimized and your performance styles are optimized, then you can work together to, you know, be more effective as a team. So that review process, yeah, at all those levels can be really helpful as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of, uh, if we go back to the player and with the short versus long-term gaps in, in the competition cycle, mm -hmm. um, does that play a significant role in terms of, you know, the player themselves and then how they manage maybe their, their, their physical, mental state, developmental plans and everything else. Can you explain a bit more about what you mean? Yeah. So let's say, you know, if we take the football example, you've, you've played Saturday, you've got to play again next Saturday. Mm. You have a, you've got like six days, well, five days probably, to physically recover um, plus, plus tweak the way you're playing to hopefully improve. Uh, whereas if we have a competition cycle of, you know, every couple of months, you have much longer to work on those things. And, and as athletes, there's a lot of kind of um, muscle memory, if you want to call it that, that's involved with some of the movements. Uh, and maybe you need to change the way you do your turning kick, for example. You mm -hmm. know, to change it in a week is pretty tricky. Um, but to change, change it over three months is probably a little bit more achievable. Um, you know, how, how, do they, how do they handle that? Um, um, yeah, good question. I think one of the things that we've got to understand is the, the week to week competition structure is because it's a team sport rather than an individual sport. Um, I think that it would, you know, there are times where it's appropriate for an individual combat sports athlete to have week to week heavy sparring or competitions every single week, but it's not something that is you know, helpful in the long run because people get injured and all those changes have to be made. When when you have a, a high performance organisation that's supporting a team, like you can, and you want to make strategic or tactical changes in the way that they play the game, you can change players. So you can have a fast runner who gets tackled really easily if you know that you can run through the defence of a team. If the following week the opponent is different, you might have a much heavier person that maybe doesn't, have as much speed that can break through a line and if someone's trying to tackle them they still get a few meters and do that so that ability to interchange with with the squads and, and things you may change your game plan but and execute the skills differently but um it's a bit different to say you know a taekwondo person fighting i don't know lightweight one week and heavy week the following week or something along those lines um i mean Uri can do that yeah I, I think regardless of um regardless of whether you compete every three months or if you compete every day, um, I think the key thing remains that the person who is the athlete or the, or the performer or the uh, individual worker who's trying to get ahead, you have to be, you have to be game ready every day and be at your best. So, you know, if you're fit and healthy and strong, and then the following day you do some training that makes you fitter and healthier and stronger. If your, you know, tactical weakness is that you can't, you know, do your turning kick properly or you can't pass the ball properly, whatever that is, you have to rectify that yourself. And I think the thing with high performance sport or high performance behaviors of any sort is that people, people who do this stuff, they're experts. They're really good at the particular thing that they do. So, you know, the best Taekwondo athletes in the world are the best fighters. They don't necessarily know. Um, they don't, they don't necessarily do things significantly better than people at club level, but they can do all of it reasonably well reasonably consistently in the time you know they have a good you know arsenal of techniques that you know the difference between them on a bad day and a good day is is not very much so you know in terms of that skill change and transferring strategy or anything like that whether that's you know between rounds between a competition um or between you know a, a rule change or over a couple of years the the ability to actually execute and change your technique and adapt to it just comes from practicing the skills regularly and being good at it. And that requires, you know, your passion, your purpose, your consistency in training, and um, I guess continuing to try and build and, and look for where you can grow and develop. So, uh, and you see that, in, I see that in the team sports, like the rugby, rugby team that I work with. And I also see it in those elite sort of fighters that work individually, that they are constantly honing their craft and rocking up, every day to training as if they're in their best shape and they're ready for competition rather than yeah. only there on the days. Of yeah. Yeah. 
And I think um, just picking up on something you said before, you know, as a techno player, you don't do your heavy sparring like every week or two, three times a week because you're just going to hammer yourself, right? So um, it's, it's rocking up to training, train consistently, but perhaps uh, depending on where you are in that lead up to the competition cycle, yeah. that influences whether you're doing a heavy sparring or whether you're doing speed or you know, something else, yeah, or, or cardio, for example. Yeah, I think sometimes that, that's where a coach has to come in and they kind of have to periodize their understanding of what that athlete or what that group of athletes that they're coaching needs and get them to the point where they're ready to survive sparring and make sure that they do well and that that means that they can go to a competition. Um, so, yeah, sometimes that load and, that, and the amount of contact will vary. And so much of that depends on, you know, your stress level, what else is going on in your life, how important training is. So for, you know, professional athletes, they might actually do contact work every single week. They might be sparring all the time because that's their job and that's all that they're focused on. So their whole life is structured around that. They're also normally people that are very experienced and have a lot of years of training under their belt. So they can cope with impact and they know how to spar and not hurt themselves. Whereas when you say, you know, a developing fighter or a young a taekwondo practitioner that wants to do a competition for the first time you don't necessarily need to do the same type of training as one of these elite athletes because you might get injured uh, and yeah. the level of competition that your coach is going to put you in is probably hopefully you know is about at, up to where your standard is at so you know that's where the really long-term thing for me of every couple of months having a competition is good because while you're training and learning and developing really quickly as you do when you're a white belt into a blue belt into a you know you know when you're going through those gut grades then uh, you have the opportunity to quickly increase your skill and you can test how you're going by doing these competitions against other people who are at a similar standard before you get to yeah. the deep end and, you know, fight Olympians and world champions and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's right. And I think you're right. It gives your body a chance to develop, right? If you're doing contact sports, then your bones, your bone density, all of that has to build up. You can't, um, you can't kind of, just jump into it straight away. It doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. I think we've kind of just hurt yourself basically. We'll probably caveat all this by saying we've deviated a little bit by away from like the psychology and mental skills component. Now we're just talking about training. Um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a not a sports scientist or a strength and conditioner, but I guess those are some observations from uh, Yeah, yeah. But we've been hit enough times to know. <laughs> Got a question down here. Um, um so Perry's got a question, and, and this is a great time because I haven't got any other prepared questions. So if you do have questions in the audience that you'd like to ask Michael, uh, please throw them in the chat. Uh, so Perry has asked at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Michael, you mentioned you're doing some mental health work uh, and, and working with the Waratahs. What does that like, look like um, in this current COVID period? Thanks, Perry. Good question. Um, as a, I guess as a mental health case manager, I would say that the work is both proactive and reactive. Um, so I deliver education sessions for the players on what mental health and mental fitness look like. So how, how to recognize when they might not be coping or someone else might not be coping, and how to open up that conversation. Um, if and when that gets brought to my attention, uh, I use my skills as a psychologist just to understand and unpack it enough to know what's going on. And being part of the high performance team, most of the time, if there is something that somebody wants to talk about or that they're worried about, I will, you know, refer them to an external support service a lot of the time. So I just get enough knowledge about, you know, what's happening for a person and, and what the particular issues are and then and ensure that either through our team doctor or through um, an employment assistance program that we have set up or some other service that they can get welfare support. Um, proactive stuff as well. During the sort of COVID shutdown, we were all sent home. So the, the players were training and competing at home. And we set up some weekly meetings where we got uh, mental health experts and sort of different leadership, people with different types of leadership experience just to have a regular check-in and help focus on growing that area when there wasn't much else that we could focus our attention on. So we shift the goalpost from on-field leadership and, and being able to provide that service in, you know, um, in a different way. Um, and that was something that I guess was more focused on helping people who were doing well to continue to grow and develop. And then the proactive and reactive one-on-one -on -one work is a bit more around that's, for people who maybe have been struggling or something along those lines. Hopefully that answers your question. Feel free to 
drop another thing in there. I see there's another question from Winnie. Mm -hmm. um, how do you keep constant mental engagement when you practice? As sometimes it can feel like just going through the motions rather than actively learning. Mm, good question. Um, I think when, when you find, if you're doing something meaningful and important like training um, and you find that you're not engaged and you don't feel like you're getting something out of it, there's probably, it's a good opportunity to check in with what's going on. So thinking about, like check in with where's my head at? What am I thinking about? How am I feeling? Um, if it's because you just don't feel motivated or something like that, then you've got to be like, there, is there something going on like in my body? Like, am I tired and I haven't had enough food and I haven't slept? So there's, that can be a motivation piece. Uh, sometimes you just feel upset or frustrated or your mind is on something outside of training. So you might've had a bad day at work or a bad day at school and you're thinking about what's going on out there and it's hard to get it, the, your mind off that and into your sport. And if something's really quite important or traumatic or really emotionally reactive and that sticks in your head for a long time i think that's when you have to have a chat with somebody like a psychologist or a gp you know i keep worrying about this thing and it's on my mind all the time and i can't sleep and i can't train then that's when you talk to somebody the natural process of just being you know your attention stuck and not stuck at different days then you know maybe that's just up to you that you had a bad training session you learn from that you go for it sometimes you can bring your attention to what you're doing set yourself little goals in what you're doing so if you don't feel like you're learning something because it's too basic make it more complex for yourself make sure you're gonna you know if it's because you feel like you're just kicking you might go all right well i'm going to try and do every kick as fast as i can or i'm going to do every kick you know with perfect technique um, and then that's something that you have to focus on and it brings your attention to what you're doing and might make it to the task a little bit more more challenging um, we do i guess from a motivation perspective we need a balance of things that are challenging for us so they need to be hard enough that they motivate us to do them but they also have to be easy and rewarding enough for us to be able to get a bit of a sense about all right this is good so if something's too easy you can make it a little bit harder but you don't want to go too hard that you end up you know losing that again if something feels too hard it might just be easy just to drop that level down you know if you're tired and all that sort of stuff you can't do a particular thing then maybe you know you do change the activity that you're doing or make it interactive or be a bit more fun in that way so yeah there's some thoughts around all that sort of stuff um feel free to shoot anything else through yeah, I think that's a that's a great great answer, uh, Michael. I'm so not used to saying Michael. I always call Michael McGee. Um, but uh, when I was a recruiter, I used to recruit accounting um, accounting candidates and and assistant accountants. This is 15 years ago. They would also always say, you know, I've done a couple of month ends. It's the same thing. I'm very bored. You know, I I know what to do already. Uh, and one thing that I used to to tell them was uh you know yes yes you can do the process now that you've done it a couple of times but really this is the point where you can actually start adding value because you understand what process wise you need to do now you need to think a little bit deeper in terms of conceptually what am i doing or um, how can i improve this process to make it better mm. um, so uh, i think that's a very similar kind of you know bridge across to to the sports training you might know how to throw a kick, you might know how to kick a ball, but um, you know, as you're doing the reps, um, being focused on what you're doing, I think is, is very key, uh, as you mentioned. And then, like you said, try to make it a little bit trickier, maybe, maybe not even trickier, maybe think, how do I make it more efficient? Um, because, you know, especially in, in, I guess in all sports, you want efficiency of movement. Um, and that, that's, that's super important. Um, so, Thank you, Winnie, for that question. Great, great question. Um, is there anything else that anyone would like to ask? If not, it's, oh, another one. Mm, so Winnie is asking about the consistency and intensity in, in training. Um, but avoiding the burnout or, or not pushing hard enough. So there's a balance, hey, so it's, it's you know, if you push too hard, you'll burn out. Mm. If you don't push hard enough, then you're just not pushing hard enough. Yeah, this is a, this is a million dollar question. I think, um, oh, 
But I think that, Michael, if we take it back to the, the plan you developed for UTS, uh, you know, leading up to the comp and we had different phases, mm. right? you know, there was still very, very intense training every time. But it was designed so that we wouldn't have high rates of injury, high rates of, um, you know, fatigue and burnout and all of that kind of stuff. Does it come down to a training plan, perhaps? I think a lot of it does. So knowing what you'd expect to do. I think when you're training at a very high intensity, you do need to, you need to do what's called periodizing the load a bit. And again, it's a bit, bit beyond my, my scope, but I think in terms of you know, across a month, maybe you have two weeks where you train really hard and one week in between that where you recover a little bit before, you know, a medium week at the end of that, or you're working out in advance that there's times where you put hard work in, um, and there's also times when you rest and you recover because that's how your muscles get stronger and they adapt. And it also helps you to mentally reset and take on what you've learned during those periods. Um, when you do lift the intensity, so when you're training harder, like you're sparring more or you're doing more intense amounts of activity and training, like you know, 100 burpee, 100 burpee day or something like that, you know, that means that you have to, you have to shorten the window that you're training for. You know, you can do long session, you know, you can, you can jog for a really long time, but you can only sprint so much. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that's maybe the analogy we're looking for here. So um, I just think in that sense, like in, in terms of how intense a level you're working at, um, just balancing that with a bit of lighter time, whether that's through your sessions, try, adjusting the, the heaviness of your session across a week or across a month. Um, mapping that probably around, you know, what other things that you have on in your life. Like if you're studying for an exam or something along those lines, um, it might get in the way if you, you know, have the exam the day after a major competition or a sparring night or something. So you have to look at which of those two things is more important at that point and then, you know, changing and adjusting some of dealing with that sometimes. Um, yeah, that's. I don't yeah, know. I, I think that's a, a great quote there. You can jog for a long time, but you can only sprint for so long. Um, that applies to sport and and the work environment as well. You know, if if you're working 12, 16 hours a day every day, you're not going to last very long. Yeah, I think it's important to focus on what's sustainable for you, and then allow people who are more experienced, like your coach or people who you're training with, to be able to guide you to work up in your tolerance window. So pushing, you know, your coach might push you a little bit harder in your class than you might push yourself when you go out and run. And, and that's a good thing because they're gonna try and push your comfort zone but do it safely. Um, sometimes I think, you know, it's possible that you might push yourself too hard too soon um, or you, you're you trying to run so fast that you lose form. So a good example, you know, if you're training and, you know, yep. you know if you're a new, practicing something that you're not very good at, uh, technically like a kicking drill, then adding lots of repetitions to it and lots of speed to it and lots of fatigue to that action, you're going to fall apart and you're still going to be doing a drill that's really complex, but you're going to be doing it wrong. You're not going to be in code, like you're not going to be able to execute it under pressure when you're competing. So working out what type of techniques or what sort of things you do as well at high intensity is also really important. Um, yeah. 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 I remember a, a seminar we did online with um, one of the national Fili Philippines players while it was locked down and mm. the question came up, you know, do you use resistant bands to, to train blocking motions? Um, and he said, first, you've got to get the motion right. Because yes. if you if you put the resistance bands in, you're just going to train the wrong motion. Um, I think that's exactly exactly what, you know, the point you're making as well. You take you take your time get it right first uh, and then work on loading up the pressure. Yeah, I think that's a nice analogy. Um, look, I think we're kind of coming towards the end of the hour. It's, it's, yes, we uh, are. So yeah, um, I would personally like to say thank you very much, Michael. Uh, it's been really a pleasure. Um, I've learned a lot. I, I hope everyone else on the call has as well. Um, so what I'll do, I'll, I'm going to post this up somewhere I haven't figured out where yet but it'll be on something probably YouTube something like that um, next week I'm talking to uh, another mate called Dr. Tehi Jung uh, Tehi I um, I made him walk through Perth with a fractured foot looking for apple strudel because um, that's the kind of coach I am 
<laughs> we actually didn't think his foot was fractured, but it turned out it was. Um, but that'll be a good good chat. We're going to talk about career motivations um, and and you know alternate career paths, perhaps. Um, so hopefully join us same time next week for that one. In the meantime, Michael, again, thank you very much. Um, I've written like three, four pages of notes here. It's been great. Um, and I can't wait till we get to kick each other again. Although I, I actually, I can wait for that because it always hurts. I look forward to some training too. Thanks, thanks, Steve, for organizing this. Thanks, it's a good, um, good thing to, to be delivering and I'm glad I could be a part of it. And, and thanks to everybody who tuned in and, and for those of you who asked questions as well. So appreciate you all putting your lunch hour aside. Cool. Thanks, man. See, See you later. Bye.